In this uh, talk with uh, Bertrand Lieter Pierbold, our professor of New Testament, on uh, the role of music and religion. Um, Bertrand, I'm, I'm always uh, very intrigued by your interest in music and the way you, uh, you're not only listening to it, you're also actively playing. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, well, <laughs> for me, music is a very important thing. I think that if you want to understand human culture and human, well, meaning seeking, then you can turn to music as well. Um, I had the honor of opening the academic year for the freshman students, for the new students who came in in the last week of August. And I did a mini lecture there on uh, religion and music. And um, that was a bit of an eye opener to a number of them. Um, I think that in our faculty, we look at culture as uh, something that is really important for what we're doing. And um, the sources of culture um, give us material that we can study and they open up perspectives on religious traditions as well. But you're, you're a specialist in words. Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> but if you know, if you look at how words are being picked up by musicians and translated into something new, uh, well, the obvious example would be, say, Matthew's Passion of uh, John Sebastian Bach, yeah. who creates a whole world out of the Gospel of Matthew and adds all kinds of stuff to it. Um, you can look at the Messiah, George Frederick Handel, and there are plenty yeah. of examples from tradition there. Uh, so they, they, yeah, they, these are traditional words, but they are picked up and transformed into something new. Right, right. When, when you play music, um, is it uh, also these kind of, let's say, text-based approaches, or is it more like music as a world <laughs> in itself? No, for me, that music is their, is their world in itself, in the sense that I play the clarinet, and mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's not much text with the clarinet. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, why, why is it written that, that um, religion and music are connected? Why, why is music so important to religion? I think that music appeals to something other than cerebral activities. So it is not uh, rational. It has a rationality of itself. It's a world in itself. And it might appeal to something similar as religion. So music and religion touch each other there. Mm-hmm. Do, do we know anything about uh, how that functioned in, let's say, er, the early church? I mean, you're a New Testament scholar. Um, is there a lot of music in the New Testament? Do we know much well, about it? Yeah, we do know that there are some hymns in the New Testament. And, mm -hmm. uh, well, a hymn is sung, so it's very likely that the earliest followers of Jesus Christ did indeed sing. Okay. Um, and obviously, we don't know anything about how they sang and what they sang musically, I mean. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Were there any instruments in those days? Yeah, there were instruments, that's clear. And um, one of the fascinating things is that in um, Old Testament texts, mm -hmm. um, there, is, there are quite a few references to uh, pipes being played. Okay. And yeah. one fascinating element uh, that I find fascinating is that these pipes were translated, the Hebrew word for these pipes was translated in the King James Version with the word organ as though in ancient Israel, there were already organs. Oh, why not? I mean, coming from a reformed background, that's a really a, a beautiful idea. Yeah, well, what I didn't know, and I found that out through a um, MA uh, thesis that I recently read, is that um, organs as in instruments were actually already there in antiquity. They were made in the Hellenistic period, mm -hmm. uh, which is yeah. very interesting for me. And it's yeah. very likely that they were used in antiquity by Christians as well. Yeah. Well, and of course, there were horns and drums and and and, yeah. and, and things like that. Yeah. What, what, what snare was instruments. Yes. You said that it touches somehow the uh, the, the same, let's say, uh, uh, existential dimension as religion uh, can touch. Um, I've become more and more interested also in uh, some aspect of brain uh, research, which yeah. indeed would point to the possibility that uh, religion and music are not so much part of the, let's say, the cerebral, the, 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 the cognitive functions of the, the neocortex, but are much more connected to the limbic system. And I was wondering how that affects our theology. If, if theology and thinking about religion is mostly a cognitive approach, mostly focusing on what we think, on concepts, on, on systematic thinking. Um, 
and in fact, religion and music are much more about our limbic system, our, our feelings, our senses. Um, uh, shouldn't that, that change our theology? I think so. I think so. And um, well, in the field of biblical studies, we speak about the cognitive turn. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the whole idea of, of um, neuro research is fundamental to how humans experience the world. It's also fundamental to how humans remember things, for instance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, if you turn to the Gospels, one element is clear from the Gospels, that is that they contain, let's say, social memories, uh, transmitted stories about Jesus. Yeah. And then it becomes really important to look into how people remember it and how people actively created memories. Yeah, but again, um... I can see that. Uh, I, I would question this focus on the cognitive part of it. At yeah, least. Well, there is more, obviously. And yes. um, I've been a member of a research group for a number of years, uh, religious experience in antiquity. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that we've looked into is how can you come to a reconstruction of, let's say, the religious experiential dimension mm -hmm. of the first Christian uh, groups uh, on the basis of the texts that we have, because we do not have those experiences, we don't have direct access to those experiences, but we do have access to descriptions of these experiences. Of course, of course. And yes, I do think that this is a fundamental uh, thing to look into. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes we, we, we tend to, to look specifically in, uh, in our ideas about the sacred, about God, yeah. about the text, about what it means. I mean, the, the, not only in our studies, but also in, uh, in how we train uh, ministers, for example. I yeah. mean, our alumni are uh, all over the place uh, doing all kinds of work, uh, but many of them are working in faith communities, um, spreading the word, so to speak. Absolutely. But yes. if, if this limbic turn, if I, I maybe even more than cognitive, it's this, if this limbic turn in theology um, would be more prominent, then probably we should teach them more, not just what they say, but what kind of tone of voice they use, uh, how they sing, how they perform, how they create the atmosphere, how they dance, and, and much more than what to say. Actually, the, um, the best example that I have witnessed of this is it, it, it looks like a Pentecostal worship service. It wasn't. It was a gig by U2, a concert by U2 two years ago. I finally managed to get into one of these concerts. And I must say it was in the Ziggo Dome in Amsterdam. This was more or less the largest religious experience I've ever witnessed. Um, many people don't know that U2 always ends their concerts with one song, the song 40. And the song, uh, the title of the song is chosen because the text of the song is Psalm 40. So they actually give like a blessing to the audience when they leave the stage. Yeah. And that is exactly what I saw happen. I saw people in religious ecstasy in Zegodo. And I think, well, it maybe is my profession that I see the religious aspect of the ecstasy. Mm -hmm. uh, many people there did see and feel and, and well, lived through that ecstasy. Yeah. Perhaps they wouldn't label that as religious, but I do. Uh, or the other way around, uh, perhaps uh, this ecstasy is part of the existential need of people to uh, to live through their experiences, to uh, to also to deal with everything that's happening in life, to to find mystery and sacred and so on. Uh, in the past, a lot of this was catered for by religions, yeah. um, and nowadays maybe there are other sources which actually tap into the same existential need. Yeah, and then I find it fascinating to come back to the language again. To see that, for instance, you too, um, yeah, they, they they use the language of scripture right. in a totally new form, uh, and many other artists do the same thing. Like, uh, if many people will know the, the song uh, "Turn, Turn, Turn, mm -hmm. Turn Birds," one of these classic songs. This is actually straight from the Bible. For right. everything, there is a time, etc. Um, so I find it fascinating that this, this language pops up again in a very different context. Yeah, so we need to study music to better understand religion and maybe also study religion to better understand music. Yes, I think so. I think so, definitely. And that's what we're doing in Amsterdam. We have a program for the future. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Thank Thanks. you so much.